and true trust in you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Okay, saints of God, you can be seated. Those who are watching online, not sure if you're going to catch on. Um, uh, today is going to be one of those, like, um, <laughs> I want to say just punchy in the mouth type words, but it is going to be tough. Just giving you guys a heads up. There's no seat belts here, but you guys should be all right. Um, see, sometimes living for the Lord um, can seem, hello, <laughs> can seem like a roller coaster ride. And man, how many of you guys have been on roller coaster rides? Y'all like them? A few of them? Sometimes? Okay. Usually try to, people try to do the best of the best. You know? They're like, oh, that's the scariest one. Okay, I want to get on it. All right? Um, but right before you go on, you got to check everything out, right? At least somebody's supposed to check everything out so people ain't seeing Jesus too soon. Amen? There he goes, ooh, Jesus, what you doing here? <laughs> You done flew out of the seat. Now, it's not going to be that crazy today, but it, we're going to go through a journey in the Word, and I strongly feel the Holy Ghost telling me to really, really um, double down and get the people of God to understand this. It doesn't matter how you met, how you came into this ministry, or how you came into this fold or flock or group or whatever. Um, it's extremely important that we hold on to the principles of God and we understand that God is really concerned about our worship, um, our desire to come to him. Uh, and for those that are watching, is the YouTube going on? Yeah. Okay, this is a very crucial, <laughs> very mm -hmm. crucial um, message even though i know we've been going through the book of revelations and you know everybody gets so excited with that type of stuff but i told you guys that you know the end times ch church would have this misunderstanding of biblically how the body of christ should operate okay now i'm going to get into some things Believing that the Holy Ghost wants us to open up some doors, all right? Open up some items, okay? Um, one of the things that uh, Jesus spoke about specifically to his disciples was this fight. This, I call it the roller coaster ride, so to speak, of life. But it's this, um, there's this tension that we have between the things that we earn, the things that we possess, amen? The things that we like to accomplish. Every, all of us have some type of goals. We have some type of upbringing, right? We have some type of foundation in what we do with what we get, amen? We have some type of mindset that says, hey, if I acquire X, Y, and Z, that will get me to this thing and get me to this thing, and then boom, 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 right? The whole world you see, social media influencers, <laughs> amen, influencing you to do what? Usually buy into what they're giving you, amen? Let's be honest. People are selling something even when they tell you they're not selling something, okay? There's, there's an agenda behind things. And see, for Christ... What Christ was doing was exposing, opening us up to something, opening, opening the, the, the human nature or the soul to what really captivates us. In Matthew 6, Jesus starts to tell us to not lay up treasures. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. I remember years ago when I used to wear, believe it or not, pastor used to wear suits. Amen. Three-piece suits. This piece suit, that piece suit. <laughs> I used to actually even work for the men's house. I was management and bridge between corporate and so forth. 
And one of the things when I read this, I was like, wow, that really happens. Now, moths don't, you know, fly up in your closet and go start eating at everything. That's not how it works, okay? It's not like a big monster or something come in and just eat up your stuff, all right? What happens is uh, they like fabric, specifically wool, okay? And when they lay, it's kind of nasty, but when they lay eggs, they actually hatch these larvae, and these larvae actually eat literally at the material. So when Jesus was saying this, he was saying, don't be so focused just on your clothing. Don't be so focused on the things that, uh, that rust away. Now, back in them days, you know, they didn't have no doom buggies. Amen. <laughs> but they had, you know, some type of riches to some type of jewels, probably some type of, you know, metals and, and precious things. But he's saying these things that you see are rotting away. Amen. He said, and someone can break in and take them from you. He said, but lay up yourselves treasures in heaven. Everybody say heaven. Okay. Treasures in heaven is the concept that Jesus is presenting now to, to his kingdom ordained saints. To the people that call themselves Christians or call themselves disciples of God, God is not just looking for belief, amen? He's looking for following him. And when we see this, it's not just enough just to get an idea of Jesus, but God is saying, I want you to follow me in every aspect of your life. And he says, where neither moth nor rust uh, nor rust, he says, neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break and steal. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's saying, wherever you hold dear to your heart, whatever you really treasure, that is where your heart is. That area of your life is truly captivated. It's truly uh, 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 in control of your heart. Another translation says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. He says, storing treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. It says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. The question is, where is your heart? Where is your heart? God is trying to open us up to something here because we're going to find out very quickly that following him is so much more hard, harder than just thinking about him. Amen. Mm -hmm. Believing him, saying, yeah, I believe Jesus. But do you trust him? Do you follow everything that he tells you to do? And this is where it's going to get really challenging for us as a body of Christ. Because the Lord loves us so much, he has to tell us the truth. Amen? And sometimes the truth hurts. Amen? It doesn't hurt your spirit, it hurts your flesh. It hurts your traditions. It hurts your emotions. Things that you've acquired in your mind and said, this is how I do my life. This is my philosophy. This is how I run the show. And that's the problem all along. Is that when you become a disciple, you become a learner. You become a learner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not what's being taught nowadays. And even as a servant of God, I have to treat, I have to treat the word of God in its full counsel and full wisdom, not just cherry picking things to kind of paint a picture that doesn't exist. Amen. And so when I saw this, I said, is Jesus really concerned 
about our clothing? <laughs> Is he worried about our possessions? He's worried about your heart being in them so much that they dictate the guidance of your life. That all your decision making is based on what you're pulling in, how much you're accumulating, how much money you're, you're getting, and let's not even talk about what actually belongs to him. Because if your life actually is in his hands, then everything else belongs to him, amen? Now we acknowledge that here, but do we actually live it here? This is what God wants to open up with us today. He says, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, everybody say healthy. healthy. Your whole body is filled with light. Meaning in, if you can see clearly what he's saying, he said, you will be spiritually healthy. You can receive all of it. I think it was one of the the preachers, was it Ray Comfort? He always talks about how, how valuable your soul is because he as, always asks people the question. He says, how much money would you, would you give, you know, or would you desire if, you know, you gave like your eyeball? People would say, oh, two, $2 million. He said, now how about both of your eyes? You lose your sight. And some people would be like, ah, I can't do that. You see what I mean? He said, 20 billion? You wouldn't do it for that? They'd be like... Nah. He said, now what about your soul? And then it's just like, boom, the anvil hits, right? <laughs> and drops. Because a reality sets into motion that Jesus said, what is it profit if we gain the entire world? You accumulate everything that you desire in this world that's already fading and dying. Amen? And God is saying, but you lose your soul. What is the profit? He even told him, he said, it, I liken that, Jesus says, we liken that to Lot's wife. He says, remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife was so concerned about her past, so, so concerned about what she was losing instead of what was ahead of her. He said, what, what was she gaining in the Lord? His promises. Even if you can't see them, the fact that he says it, that actually makes it valid. That which, that's what true faith is actually about, y'all. It's trusting in him when you don't see it with your eyes. When you can't even touch it with your hands. God is saying, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You cannot be blinded by this, y'all. By your carnal perspective. God is saying you got to go deeper. And one of the things that we dishonor God with our lives is our giving. Is our posturing to him. Because when we get threatened, and I'm going to say it now I hear it in the Holy Ghost. When we get threatened by the discomfort of finances, and possessions and things that we feel like we must have in our lives. That is where we're truly challenged to see whether or not our heart is in him or our heart is in other things. And it's unfortunate, terribly unfortunate, that the body of Christ statistically does not give. This, the body Christ statistically looks at any type of thing related to finances as gimmicky, as showmanship, as something like, ah, you can do all this stuff, but the word of God, it should be no price. This should be no price. That should be no this. That should be no that. Oh, here we go. There we're talking about finances. We're talking about this here. And then this is what the human flesh normally does. The moment money comes up, Heart starts beating. Ooh, 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 what's going on? Huh? <laughs> Palms start getting sweaty. Mind starts getting like, oh, wait a second. Hold on. This, ty this ty type of church? This 
And it's unfortunate because we've been programmed psychologically to look at possessions, finances, all these things as something that God don't really care about that. He's just tripping off of these things. And, you know, hey, we're not really going to talk about it scripturally, what that looks like. A pastor and a true elder, a true teacher of God's word, has to teach the entire counsel of the word of God. And it's so unfortunate that we have so many so-called preachers, teachers, that preach something in order for the congregation to get something out of it. Amen? It's more of a, hey, I'm going to teach you this principle, right? And so you can get out of God what you desire. That's manipulation. Instead of saying, God, I don't want to be manipulated. I want to be motivated. I want to be motivated by your love. I want to be motivated by your truth. I want to be motivated by that peace that only comes from you, that goes beyond my way of thinking, all understanding. Are y'all catching it? Because I'm going to tell you that's the way most of us get stressed out is when it comes to money. Amen? When it comes to finances, when it comes to our stability, our security being threatened. Because the truth is, is we get pressed into a corner. And that corner is either us saying, God, I trust you. And I'm going to depend on you. And I'm going to make something happen. Or you're going to fold like a deck of cards. And do whatever it takes for you to keep chasing that wheel, chasing like the, like the, what is it, that hamster wheel, <laughs> and keep things maintaining. When we serve of God, hear me in the Holy Ghost. See, we're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you guys some beautiful things that I saw in the Word of God today. And right now, your flesh is going to be like, mm, chop suey. You're going to be feeling it. Because that's what the word of God is supposed to do. But God is trying to show us something that we go beyond what you've seen in times past of manipulation. Where now you can operate in true motivation. And then eventually, when you truly start operating as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, hear me in the spirit of God. You will now start looking at your life not as your own. That the, the immense, immeasurable riches of the Lord Jesus Christ are at your disposal. And all God wants out of your life is multiplication. Multiplication. Let's talk more about Jesus. Jesus says your eye is unhealthy. Your whole body is filled with darkness. Meaning in, if you don't see clearly, your body won't be clear. Okay. He's saying, and if the light you think you have. <laughs> and what he's saying is the perception, the understanding that you think you have is actually darkness. How deep that darkness is. God wants full clarity when it comes to this now. He says, no one can serve. Everybody say serve. serve. You cannot serve two masters. He said, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted or committed. Your loyalty will go to one and you will despise the other. He said, you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Now, some people will say, well, are you telling me, preacher, that people in the body of Christ 
can't be broke or can't be rich? No, I'm not saying that. But then I will ask you, what do you define as richness? <laughs> what do you define as poor? Because I know one thing as the body of Christ can't be stingy. Amen. We can't be greedy. We can't be selfish. That is not coming from the spirit of God. No matter how you look through the scriptures, nowhere does it say that we are supposed to be that way. It didn't say that we couldn't be rich, but it said that there'll be some problems with rich and even operating in a poor mindset. Amen. So this is some really crucial stuff that I hope you guys hear in the spirit. What this man of God is saying, what the spirit of God is showing us. OK, we're going to go on a little journey. It's going to be good. But I believe something is going to happen to your inner man today. He says, trust in the Lord with all. Everybody say all of my heart. Not 50%, not 5%, not 99.9 .9 and some change. God is saying all, 100% of your heart. Trust in me. That is the, we say this, but I'm telling you guys, I know for a fact that when finances and things go on the line and stuff just goes out, out of the box, this is where you really start thinking, okay, God, am I trusting you or not? Is this a reality in my life or not? Did I give you all of my heart or did I give you some of it? Did I give the job more of it? I was saying it out of my mouth, but my heart was divided. I was thinking it in my mind but I knew deep down this thing had me. The thought of you being out of a specific, I call it realm of security. You know what that is for you. You can say, I am willing to go through this much in your mind. And then God says, I know what you can handle. <laughs> you don't help me Lord you saying God ain't never ain't never gonna happen like this and the Lord's like oh no I see you be able to go through this and this and that and that you just didn't see it I see it you trying to duck and dodge it though well I'm trying to get you to now trust me with all of your heart For you to stop depending on your own reasoning, your own understanding about everything. This is so crucial for a true born again believer. For you to develop and be a true disciple of the Lord, this is key. This is key. Because we are taught to really trust no one. <laughs> Amen? When you grow up, most of the world... I joked about this with my bishop. He, we always joke about this. Back in the day, he was, just, he was just crazy. He said he was that type of dude that have a conversation with you. He had a friend of his, or a, a so-called friend, associate. They were chopping up about something. He's digging into his pocket, and he saw his friend... Drop like $20 or something on the ground, right? Now, instead of saying, hey, you dropped your money, he went like this. Put it over his foot, all right? Put his foot over it and had a whole conversation with him for about 15 minutes about nothing. Thinking in his mind, like, as soon as he leaves, I'm taking this $20 off out of my box. That's pretty crazy, right? Some of y'all are like, oh, no, that's me. No, that's <laughs> me, Jesus. Y'all get that little extra change from somebody. Be like, oh, the Lord blessed me. Be like, they're supposed to give me $10 back. Gave me $100 back. Look at this. Look at God. Be like, you robbing folk. Better tell somebody what's up. It's hard, y'all. 
He's like, he's like, can't lie to the Holy Ghost. Can't. This is what the Spirit of God just told me. He said, let me take you on a journey of faith. Let me take you through this process of trusting in me. He said, don't be afraid. He said, I know you trusted in another way before. Let me show you this way. Let me show you how I worked with many other servants who had pivotal moments in their lives where they didn't know which way they were going to go. But they decided to give their all to the Lord. It says, seek his will in all you do. And he will show you which path to take. The key is, is seeking his will above your own. Saying, Jesus, I really desire this, but nevertheless, I desire your will above my own desires. That's, that's the humility I want to operate. Because I know your way is better than my way. I know your thoughts are greater than my thoughts. Jesus, I'm looking for you to be my counselor, my comforter, not the other way around. He said, in every aspect of your life, be honest, be honest. Are you doing this? When the paycheck comes, do you look in and say, God, I thank you for this? Or are you running fast enough to buy that thing that you thought about? Are you immediately thinking about the debt collectors and the creditors and the this and the that and that's what you're behind? Or are you saying, Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for the provision. And will you thank him even if a check doesn't come in? Even when the notices go on the door. Even when the sheriff comes in and says, you can't live here no more. Will you thank him in those moments? Will you trust him like that? God will take us down a path A path that we are like, hey, I don't know what's going to happen. But he is pleased when we trust him wholeheartedly. And whatever area of life you're in right now, I'm going to tell you something. God's way is always greater than our own. It doesn't, no matter what. You don't got to know front to back this thing. You got to know that one thing. Now, Proverbs, to give you some context, is written by Solomon. Amen? You guys know Solomon was considered the wealthiest man on the planet. All right? Bill Gates ain't got nothing on him. Uh, what's, the, what's the little make-believe people? Tony Stark? No. Nah. <laughs> Who's the other guy? Bezos? Musk? I think Jeff Bezos is the one guy. All them dudes combined. Times this, times that. Ain't got nothing on him, Okay. But in the end of everything, and him dealing with contamination by, you know, getting with a whole lot of women, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> but he opened himself up to a lot of things, but he realized the wisdom that he got was from above, from God himself. And he starts to share these beautiful, you know, jewels or nuggets 
of heavenly wisdom. And he tells them about trusting in God. And this is kind of like the, the, the core of it. He says, don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Right? I know some of us could be like, man, I'm a wise decision maker. People look for you to guidance and all that stuff. But you got to humble yourself. Amen. You got to get to that place. And I could be that way, too. I was a very independent person. And, I, and I, when I stepped out, and I was like, oh, I'm going to step out, and the Lord told me to do this. Do you know I had to find out this for myself? That even though I was very articulate, could, you know, go independently and, and complete tasks and all that other stuff, talented and all those other things, I was still lacking foundationary wisdom. The foundationary wisdom was me relying on my own train of thinking all the time. <laughs> Did you catch it? Not saying sometimes you ain't thinking right, but, but most of the time, amen, as what he's saying, don't be impressed by your own line of thinking, your own wisdom, your own application of your own knowledge. He said, instead, fear the Lord, meaning in reverence God in all that you do and say and think about, Amen. Stop yourself and say, God, should I even say this? And she knows, <laughs> help me, Lord. That don't happen all the time. Amen? Should I? I hmm. So I'm the only one here? Y'all just, just don't blurt out stuff and just say something? Be like, oh, I did not say that. And the Lord be like, you, it's not it's just what you say, it's what you've been brewing. You've been stirring up that thing on the inside. God is like, what you stirring up? Stop. Turn away from evil. Turn away means turn away. Amen? Now look at the context here. He says, then you will have healing. Everybody say healing. healing. It says for your body. And strength. For your bones. When you do this, start fearing God, start relying upon his wisdom from above, not from below. Amen. He said healing will come to your body. He says strength will come into your bones. This is the kicker. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Everybody say honor. Honor means honor. Reverence. Display loyalty. Display commitment. Display high regard to the Lord with what? Your wealth, not other people's wealth. Amen? Amen. What you got. He says, and with the best part, he said, with the best part of everything you produce, how do we do that? Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. Everybody say good wine. Good wine. All right. Another translation says, honor the Lord with your possessions. Think about all that you accumulate. Clothing, finances, your job yourself, like all these things, businesses. Some people be like, well, Lord, you know, I, I give here and there and I got a little rental property. You know, that ain't really me, my income, but it's, you know, it, it's all of your increase. Amen. Mm -hmm. See, we like to play that with God. See, God don't want Pharisees, new, he doesn't want uh, uh, New Testament 2.0 Pharisees, amen? <laughs> Where you like, I need to make sure I get a little bit on a 10%, on a 10 We're going to get into that too, because y'all going to find out real quick that a lot of stuff we've just been shoved down is not actually correct. It says, honor the Lord with your possessions. This is a real thing, you guys. The Holy Spirit wants us to do this right. And what I mean do this right is what you have learned, maybe in times past, maybe it was okay, 
Maybe you got a portion of this, but the whole thing needs to be the whole thing now. Now you got to get it from Genesis to, Revela to Revelation. How does this work in your life? It says, with the first fruits of all your increase, honor the Lord. The best part, not the leftovers. Amen. Let me give you an example. Because this used to be challenging for me. And I could be honest. And, and I think today is a day where I want to encourage you guys to trust in God, but also be challenged by this word. Don't play with it. Because many of people have developed ministries all in the name of the Lord or what they think is the name of the Lord. But the heart of it was greed. The heart of it was not a heart <laughs> that served the correct master. Amen. They were serving something else. But just because you see that doesn't mean that there isn't authentic. Amen. Doesn't mean that there's not a moral or more holier way to do things. When I saw this, I said, Lord, so what does this even look like for us? What does this look like biblically for the body of Christ? To honor the Lord with our possessions, to honor the Lord with our earnings. And there's beautiful guidance with this. He says a benefit of this is that your barns will be filled with plenty. He said your vats will overflow with new wine. With all that being said, is that there is, even if you're not doing it, and this is the thing, you're honoring God because he is amazing. He is wonderful. This is a love relationship here. Amen. He's not genie of the lamp. He's not the spiritual ATM machine. Amen. He's not, oh, uh, let me see if I can put in five in here, hit the slots, and then hold on, it's going to hit seven, seven, seven. Okay, maybe if it does, <laughs> some of us get in trouble down, down Vegas. Amen. Help me, Lord. <laughs> Have the ground people be like, get off, get off the machine. He'd be like, one more. That's how you know you got problems when you're walking up to people. And you, and, you, and you go on saying like, hey, uh, hold on, like, hey, how you doing? Hey, how you been doing on the slots? You been doing okay? All right, okay. Five dollars? He's like, can you get five dollars? <laughs> and then you're looking at everybody else on that machine. Like, hey, hey, hey I'm still there. <laughs> like, pastor talking about going to Vegas? No, I'm talking about a past, my former life. Amen. I'm talking about how we cannot get caught up into this uh, this desire, this overwhelming desire to look at God when it comes to our giving as a spiritual ATM machine, as we're, we're playing the slots, right? Like, well, God, I threw this out here, so therefore, you know, hey, what was it called? This, we're supposed to reciprocate. God is like, no, 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 no. This is honor. Honor me. With what you have. Honor me. With the first fruits, no leftovers. And see, I tried to do that years, years ago when I didn't know no better. <laughs> and I was in contracting. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm gonna deduct all this first and let me just see what, you know, my expenses, let me see. Okay, round up this. Okay, all right. So, yeah, I guess I can give about this, you know, whatever, right? And I thought I was doing my duty, like, okay. And even when I worked nine to fives and all that other stuff and, you know, everything after taxes, the whole nine, and they go, okay, this is what you got, boom. I was, like, proud, like, hmm, here. 
Write the check, boom, here. Weekly. Consistent. But then I got challenged. I got challenged when things weren't consistent. Help me, Lord. <laughs> I got challenged when God was saying, I want you to go above what you said in your heart. You've been saying 10%. When I was telling you, hey, go put this over here. And you try to shake it off. Like, oh, no, 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 I didn't hear that. Hold on, hold on. No, oh, no. You said that? Wait a second. Or somebody, the Lord's talking to you. They say, give him $200. I be like, hold on, hold on. You'll be trying to make sure you're going ear, earwax, like your ears are clear. Like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me hear this. Like, you near the ocean, right? <laughs> you just came up out of the water. And see, that's often what the Lord does is he'll press you beyond your expectations. You say, oh, no, God, don't put more on me. He can bear. Okay. Ask the cripple man. Ask the blind man. He told them to stand up. He told them to do things beyond what they thought of themselves, and it happened. And this is what I'm trying to get everybody or the Holy Ghost is trying to get us to understand something tonight. Is that when it comes to honoring God with our wealth, are we looking at every aspect and saying, God, my heart is with you, not with these things. And therefore, I will honor you with it. Because the moment it shifts, the moment you got something inside of you that's saying, oh, well, I, die, I got my 10%. Art. And, and let's be honest. Statistically, you can look it up, but um, the body of Christ, at least I would say Protestant, don't really do it like that. People are not really like gung-ho about that because it's been tainted in the culture. How we communicate giving. Our minds are like, oh, it's gimmicky. It's, show, it's showmanship. And God is like, this is a part of your life. We pray the Lord. Lord, I want to see the vision. God is saying, amen, provision is coming. And we pray for the jobs. We pray for the things that God is saying, I want you to be a good steward over. But then the moment it's in our possession, we don't honor him. We pick and choose when we're going to do stuff. Saying, God, this was yours all along, and I'm gonna give it to you. And, and, and God, this is where the Spirit has led me to this point. And God will often tell you something even greater. Remember, He talked about the parable. He said, if a man, He said, you have two coats, what did He say? And someone takes one, what did He say? Give one, right? 50%, y'all. He said, you own two, you give in half. But then Bible, we'd be like, hold on. I thought it was just 10%. We're going to get into all that in a moment. Because after this, your flesh is going to feel like chop suey. But your inner man is going to be renewed. It's going to be like, oh, wow. I get the truth today. You see, the devil trying to punch you in the head and make you not trust God with all of your heart, with all of the things that God has entrusted you with in the first place. It's time for us to honor him. You see, your barns will be filled with plenty. Your vats will overflow with new wine. There are things that God wants you to manage. And he desires them. This is one thing I can say about the Lord. And I talked to you guys about this. What is that wall made out of? What do y'all think it is? Some wood, some metal, right? Okay, where do we get those materials? 
Don't say Home Depot. <laughs> Lowe's? <laughs> uh, no, it ain't at Dollar Tree, amen? It is from a tree, though. Hallelujah. There we go. If you look at God's creation, everything is multiplication. Everything is fruitfulness. The tree produces a seed. The seed produces the opportunity for more things to grow. Catch it in the spirit, what I'm saying. Why do you think Jesus was so bothered when he looked at that fig tree? He said, you're not living up to your potential. Cursed. Some people be like, oh, the fig tree, why? Why Jesus cursed the fig tree? In the same setting, he looks at the entire temple and he says, this temple is not living up to its potential. I got to get rid of all these demonic characters. <laughs> the den of thieves. He said, my father's house will not be a den of thieves. He said, but a house of prayer. He starts getting rid of and, and just hitting all the, the animals and, and flipping over the tables. This is not being productive. This is not being fruitful. And when you understand true discipleship, it comes with a cost. But God is looking for multiplication. God is looking for fruitfulness. Amen? Where your heart is, he said, no one can serve two masters. No one can serve God, right? Love God and love money. He said, wherever your treasure is, that is where your what? Everybody say heart is. Heart. Wherever your treasure is, that is where your heart is. Now, I want to give you guys a little understanding. So let's unpack this a bit since this is Bible study here. Okay? You guys could look on and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't, because I will be posting things. We do it in our Bible study. And then you can always, you know, look into this stuff and copy paste, things like that. Tithing. How many of you guys think tithing is how much? What have you guys been told? It's how much? 10%, right? 0 0.10 times. Blah, blah, blah. Carry the... No. <laughs> tithing in the Old Testament is described as three types of tithes. Okay? This was a portion that was pulled out to honor the Lord, okay? Now, when we look at this here, you guys are going to see something, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to open up your mind a little bit. If, unless you guys already seen this before, amen, then we're just going to double down on it today. But there was a priestly tithe for the children of Israel, the Levitical tithe. This is known as the sacred tithe. This is a tithe that was given to the Levites, right? Those that operate in the temple, right, took care of them. Anyone that served as a priest inside the temple. Now, pastors today would say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see how that, you know, Levitical tithe takes care of the priests. We're the priests now. So, hey, therefore, uh, yeah, that's what it is. Okay. There's some truth to this, but let's be, keep it in context. Amen. So. This is dealing with the children of Israel. Then there was a feast tithe, and this tithe was set aside to cover the cost of traveling to Jerusalem for festivals. Okay? There's scripture to back that up. I don't have time to open up all of it. Okay? You guys can find it on Google. Thank God we got search engines that are pretty effective. Okay? But this was another tithe that was pulled for traveling, okay? For certain festivals and things like that, all right? Then you got a poor tithe. I don't want to call it poor tithe, but this is essentially welfare. Keep it a buck with you guys, okay? Because this was a tithe that was given every three years to help orphans, widows, travelers, sojourners who couldn't provide for themselves. So basically, God had set up a system for his nation to take care of themselves, 
to look out for each other. Well, we would go now to San Diego County or Orange County or wherever, if you've ever been on EBT, food stamps, you know the whole thing, okay? Maybe they'd be super stingy, like, oh, we ain't giving nothing to nobody. <laughs> you got to be practically dying to get help. Help me, Jesus. At least I remember back in Bakersfield, they was not playing with us. They thought we was trying to con people. That's the first thing they do, look at your address and be like, they look on Google Maps and be like, you don't need no help, what are you talking about? And I'm not saying that people don't scam because there is scammers out there, all right? But here's the bigger picture. The things that we do now, government-wise, to look out for those that are a little, the, the, less, the, 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 the less fortunate, right? Those are in real help, orphans. Orphans don't have parents, amen? Amen? Okay. Widows don't have that support system that typically culturally would be in place, right? having a husband, having someone to provide, okay? Sojourners, travelers, right? So they had a system that was not based on 10%, amen? It was actually 23.3333, 3%. It really was, 23%, okay? Biblically, scripturally, for the nation of Israel. So everybody thinking out like, whoa, so wait a second, not 10% ain't enough. <laughs> Are we supposed to be doing 23%? Now, here's a, here's a fun fact. A fun, useless, and kind of absurd fact. Do you know that Mormons are told to tie 20%? Now, this is pretty sad. Look, tithing is not about just, let's just keep the lights on. And let's just make sure we have gift baskets for everybody to walk in. Because I've I, I ran into some. You remember Lynn? Lynn used to help us out. That's what she was motivated when we were doing those gift baskets. You, you helped her, remember? At her house. Yeah. And she told me, because she had some Mormon friends that she you know, knew, and they was like doing that constantly. Because their concept is, we do a bunch of good because we're trying to get into you know, the next kingdom. You know? we're, trying to, we're trying to earn our way into... A, we're trying to basically, instead of like people like, oh, I'm trying to, you know, earn up a way and, 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 and get into, you know, the nicest mansion. They're like, no, I'm trying to get a planet. That's how they believe. It's just wild. OK, they're not a denomination of Christianity, by the way. They, they are definitely off. We don't believe in the same Jesus. OK, so just just for the record. But I found it interesting that a cult or a uh, 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 a religious institution like them actually give more, <laughs> right, of their wealth than even we that actually have the truth. Because we have, like I said, uh, a stigmatism about money. Amen? You could be honest, especially in California. You know, what is supposed to be one of the wealthiest uh, states. Well, at least I remember maybe 10 years ago. I mean, they said it was what? Fifth largest economy in the world, something like that. And obviously, a lot of it is convoluted right now. But the reality is, is we are very funny with our money. Amen. <laughs> we tend to be like, ooh, you know, like what they said, squeezing the blood out of, out of a turnip. We'd be like, how can I make a nickel turn into $100? <laughs> I had a friend of mine that was, what's the term? He wasn't broke. He was uh, frugal. Amen. He was frugal. <laughs> I would be the one that's like, I remember I was trying to take a test back in uh, Culver City, if you guys know where that is. It's in LA, West LA area. And we were doing it for like this exam for like inspectors or whatever. And I was telling him, hey man, we need to stay in the hotel that the very exam is happening. Like that's wisdom, amen? He looked at the price, he said, oh no, 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 we need to go to Crenshaw, we need to go to, I said, what? Hold on. I said, what are you talking about, homie? He's like, oh no, I got a good price. The pri I was like, price is right, what are you talking about? He said, price line, you know the guy on TV, the price line? I got a good deal. Man, we stayed up in some hot, what is it, hostel? It looked like 
Somebody was like, I don't know, look, look like out of a straight horror film, all right? Had me looking at the sheets. I literally wanted to cover it three times and then burn them. I was literally like this the whole time, hearing, hearing the cops, everything. I was, I was like, in the middle of the night, like, this fool crazy. And he was one of my elders, so we were, you know, we were kind of, it was tight at the time, but I remember calling my bishop. I said, Bishop, I said, I got last little money. I said, I'm going to use a little bit of this money, and we're going to get the hotel the day before. We're going to stay in that hotel and cram and make sure that we get our adequate amount of sleep so we can just walk down straight into that hall and take this exam. Not know, oh, we, we driving, going from Sepulveda to this, and we going over here. That's what it was for the first few days when I listened to him. And I was telling him, you got to use wisdom. Put more into things. And see, oftentimes, I, oh, salam on now. Here, feel the Holy Ghost. At that time, he didn't know how important that license that we were about to get. I ended up getting, praise the Lord, 98%. Hallelujah. He got 70%. Barely. <laughs> Hope you don't watch this. But I stood up late with them, too, like four in the morning. And I told him, see what I mean? I said, well, you barely got over it. He was crying everything. We was both crying because we was going through it. And we, we drove over the hill because we were in the Bay Area. We drove all the way down, used our last little bit of gas money, right? We, we, if you want to be honest, I even asked people for help. I said, I said, I told people, I said, I believe this is going to change everything. I need some help. People poured into us. I paid them back, you know? But it's one of the reasons why I was able to even expand in business. It was like a piece connected to another piece connected to another piece. And I'm going to tell you right now, that's how God works. He wants to see what you're doing with what you get. Instead of being so afraid, oh, I'm just going to stay up in this spot and just wait for something to happen. God's like, get up out of the bed and go do something. Do something with what I've given you. And even despite that, I was like, I'm a man of God. I'm a pastor over this church and everything else. Are we behind stuff? And the Lord's like, trust me. I'm like, okay. Behind a few house notes, okay, Lord. You, I'm thinking, let me put this to the side for this. The Lord's like, go down over the hill <laughs> to L.A. and go get that. Little did I know that that license was going to be connected to thousands of jobs down the road. You see what I mean? But I was thinking, like, just for that moment. Remember what I told you guys early, earlier? It is impossible to please God without what? Faith, amen? He said, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. It don't matter if you don't see it right now. You got to trust the one that's behind all of it. Who's saying, don't get clouded by your vision. He said, for we walk by what? Faith, not by sight. Not by your human perception. And so when it comes to giving, guys, I'm telling you right now, it got to be done in faith. When it comes to what you get, pour in with that mindset. Don't have a poor mindset, amen? <laughs> and I had to help my brother. And what's surprising is he's very, he's got multiple businesses now. I'm like, you the one that told me all this other stuff. Now you, you know, but hey, that, that, that happens. And so for the Old Testament here, there's three types of tithes. 23%. It says, according to the scriptures, tithing or giving a tenth is found before Israel as a nation before the Mosaic laws were given. Okay. So, so for some of you guys, you'll hear people say, I don't need to get my tithe no more. That was a part of Israel. That's the Old Testament. We in the New Testament. Okay? All right. Okay. Let me, let me hold. Let me put your feet to the fire a little bit. Yes. Tithing was a process, and it wasn't just 10%, it was 23%, okay, according to the nation of Israel. However, before there was a nation of Israel, God was dealing with Abraham and Jacob. And these verses tell us something, amen? 
They tell us this setup where God, there was an always the, this acknowledgement of what you, what you accomplished, what you possessed, what you acquired. You always gave thanks and honor back to God. Amen. And there was a way that that was done before there was even a Mosaic law, before there was 613 laws. OK, this was a principle that was already established. It said the New Testament attests to this kind of giving as well. OK. Said the Israelites were required to tithe by law. It says, but when all of their, uh, uh, but when all of their required giving is taken into account, they actually give around twenty-three percent of their income. Some examples of tithing in Old Testament include Abraham, Jacob offering tithes to God, Genesis four and fourteen and twenty-eight, and Jacob's vow in Genesis twenty-eight twenty through twenty-two. Other Bible verses include. Right. These these uh, mentioned tithing. Right. Leviticus 2730, Proverbs 39, which we just read and Numbers 18, 25 through two, which I'm not going to take you through. All right. He says, and blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. Who's talking? OK. It says that Abraham or Abraham. Right. Gave Mel, uh, Melchizedek. Some people say Melchizedek. I, at, at this point, I don't really care. But <laughs> it says a tenth. Of all the goods he had recovered. Okay, no law. There was no Israelite nation yet. Amen? But they already said, I'm pouring in what I acquired. In fact, if you guys want to look at the verse and kind of be a good Berean, it said that Melchizedek, who was a priest of God, okay? He was a high priest of God, actually gave something to Abraham. You see what I mean? So there was an exchange there, right? And constant acknowledge and reverence of the most high God. Amen. He said, blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. It says Abraham what? Gave him a tenth of the goods he had recovered. OK. Then you see here what Jacob, he said, Jacob made this vow. God will indeed be with me and protect me on this journey. And if he will provide me with food and clothing, he says, and if I return safely to my father's home, he said, then the Lord will certainly be my God. And this memorial pillar I have set up will become a place for worshiping God. And I will present to God a tenth. Everybody say a tenth, a tenth. of everything he gives me. He gives me. In Hebrews 7, it says Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem. And also a priest of God's most high when Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings. This is the context. It says um, Mel uh, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. He said, then Abraham took a tenth of all he had and captured it in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek means king of justice and king of Salem means king of peace. It said, there is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever. It's a resembling the son of God. So everything that's done, like I told you guys, the Old Testament is the New Testament what? Concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. You see it here. You see it here. It's a foreshadow. It's a constant principle. An eternal principle that says, hey, we acknowledge the priest. But here's the thing. Now we got a high priest. Amen. The son of God, the Lord Jesus. And so we think it's all shut down. No, guys. Help me, Lord. See, a tenth was required because, you know, they got the victory. Amen. They got the victory. They got the victory, the Old Testament battle. But now, hallelujah, because of Christ Jesus, we have the victory in him. Amen. And so now God is saying, I want you to give all. I want you to give above, beyond. I don't want you to get caught up into, like I, I said before, the manipulation madness. I want you to get into motivation. When you're motivated by the love of Jesus Christ, when you're motivated by who you are with him, you want to multiply. You want to be fruitful. You want to operate in abundance with him. Amen. I'm not a prosperity preacher. Hear me. 
But I know that we have to kind of double down on some things that are being taught improperly, okay? We have to double down on these things, especially how pastors, teachers, and priests are supposed to be looked upon New Testament-wise, how the body of Christ is supposed to actually look out for each other, okay? But I'm going to give you guys a nice setup because i got to follow the Word of God. He says, consider how great Melchizedek was. Even Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel, recognized this giving him a, by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle. Now, the law of Moses required that the priests who are descendants of Levi must collect a tithe from the rest of the people of Israel who are also descendants of Abraham. So you see this principle continuing on. He says, but Melchizedek, who was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham. He says, and Melchizedek, he said, place a blessing upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promises of God. He says, and without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater. If I say greater, greater. than the one who is blessed. The priests who collect tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they are because we are told that he lives on. In addition, we might even say that these Levites, the ones who collect the tithe, pay a tithe to Melchizedek when their ancestors, Abraham, paid a tithe to him. He says, for although Levi wasn't born yet, he said the seed from which he came was Abraham's body when Melchizedek collected the tithe from him. Look how amazing that is. I mean, just... Amazing how the word of God and the lineage and everything connects like that. He says, so if the priesthood of Levi on which the law was based could have achieved the perfection God intended. He says, why did God need to establish a different priesthood with a priest in the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Levi and Aaron? He says, and if the priesthood is changed, the law must also be changed to permit it. So here's basically what he's saying. God used this to forecast our high priest in Christ. Amen? That he would conquer it all. And what he would expect out of us, the, the thing that God is giving y'all, eternal life, no one can outgive him on that. Amen? This is truly just his grace. Now he's saying, honor me with your life. Just like he said, he said, I died. He said, I sacrificed my life. Now I'm calling you to be a living sacrifice. You ain't got to die, but your desires need to die. <laughs> I want you to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto me. He said, this is our true form of worship. In Malachi 3, you guys have probably seen this before, where it says robbing God, right? Should people cheat God? Or rob God. He says, yes, you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When, you, when do we ever cheat you? You have cheated me on the tithes and offerings due to me. So tithes is a portion they have agreed upon. Amen? Offering is beyond that. Okay? He said, you are under a curse for, a whole, for your whole nation has been cheating on me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing. Everybody say a blessing. blessing. See, we catch this and we say, oh, blessings, blessings. I want blessings. <laughs> Be careful. I always say don't get caught up in the blessings. Get caught up in the blesser. Amen. It's just so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Do you guys know that all the times I've read in the scriptures that talks about don't put the Lord God to a test, right? It says, don't challenge him here. But then here, it says, put me to the test when it comes to finances, when it comes to income, when it comes to pouring in. I think God knows something about the heart, amen? He knows that's where we get weird. We got our different things. I know Sister May, for a while, she used to be up in them coupon books. Help me, Lord. I'd be like, girl, you got to have a coupon for everything. 
They're like the people with coupon shopping. You ever seen them? And they got like 100 different Gatorades. You'd be like, how do you get this Gatorade for $25? They'd be like, look, I just know what's up. I came in the right time, right process. People would be like scanning stuff, like, help me, Lord. So you should give us a heads up before you show up. Nah. <laughs> but the Lord is saying, put me to the test with this. See what I'll do. When you honor me in all those areas, he said, your crops will be abundant for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine, he says, before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then all nations will call you blessed for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies. He says, you have said terrible things about me, says the Lord, but you say, uh, but you say, what do you mean? What have we said against you? You have said, what's the use of serving God? He said, what have we gained by obeying his commands or by trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we are sorry for our sins? Yikes. <laughs> he says, from now on, we will call the arrogant blessed for those who do evil get rich and those who dare God to punish them uh, suffer no harm. He says, then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other and the Lord listened to what they said. In his presence, a scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about the honor of his name. So you see these themes, fear, honor. It says, they will be my people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Help me, Lord. <laughs> I don't even want to get into that, but... It's always that kid that'd be acting crazy and then the other kid to watch and say, nope, a tin hut. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about yet. Who got siblings in here? Hallelujah. Amen. We used to watch one and be like, oh, I ain't getting that business. I'm going to get together. Amen. I'll say, that's, that's worse than they come up trying to, trying to get you whooping. You crying ugly. And then you'd be like, I just made it out. Help me, Lord. He said, then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. This is a part of our service to God. Amen. I don't know how to explain it any other way, y'all. It, it, I know it's hard because I'm like, man, I'm taking y'all through some straight history. Scriptures that are just on top. The, the evidence is just there, y'all. Okay. I'm going to skip that part. You guys can read the other one another day because that's, uh, that's New King James. Okay, let's bring it to Jesus for a second. All right? Before the cross. All right? Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, the scribes. Okay? He said to them in this teaching, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes. Right? They just floating. <laughs> he said, Love greetings in the marketplace. He said, The best seats in the synagogues, right? And the best places at feast who devour widows' houses. He says, and for a pretense, make long prayers. Basically, in so many words, they doing too much, okay? He said, these will receive greater condemnation. God is saying they gonna get it, okay? For acting all snooty. He says, now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasure. They were collecting, all right? He says, and many who were rich put in much. Now, I shared this with some of y'all. I was like, okay, got $100. You're like, okay, I'm going to put $10 in. All right, cool. Is what it is, $100, whatever. Then you get $1,000, then you get ten k then you start making six figures, then you're like, oh, hold on. Oh, help me, Jesus. You ain't used to putting money like that into a ministry, amen? You ain't used to putting money like that into anybody's anything except for a car, a property, investments, amen? Oh, see, it's, it's all quiet. I'm, see, okay. I'm just trying to tell y'all something. Because there was a time where I couldn't even imagine making a certain amount of money. And then when I got into that realm, I was like, oh, okay. But then I was just like, oh, we got to get more, though. Help me, Lord. And he'd take more taxes. Hey, Amen. Help me, Jesus. 
I remember I was talking to my bishop years ago because he grew up like on a farm. And when he got in an accident and he got awarded a certain sum of money, it, it was, he was losing it for a second. Because they cut a check that was close to like about a million or something like that. Okay? Because of how, how bad like the accident was and stuff like that. And he remember walking into the, the Wells Fargo, wherever he was, shaking like, please don't. I don't want to do nothing with this check. You know, like he thought he was going to rip it up. And say, oh, oh. Like, <laughs> And the people were just like looking at it, it was just like, oh man, who is this dude, you know, trying to, trying, to, trying to come in, right? And before when he walked into a bank, he tried to open up an account, and he'd just be like this, like, please, 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 please. <laughs> he said they'd look at his credit score, look at him, look at back, and they'd be like, let me see the biggest stick I can hit. Get up out of here! Trying to open up in a check account, knowing you can't even do... Can't do nothing with what you got, right? That's when you know it's bad, when they don't even want to open up anything with you, okay? they like, they just like, now they just calm about it. They just get a little thing, say, oh. And they mind, they're probably thinking, why did this person just waste my 15 minutes of my life knowing that they wasn't going to get approved for no checking account, right? But he comes in with that, shaking. They look at it, then they find it's legit. They get on the phone put it all through, and then all of a sudden it's like, here, come to our little special, you know, da 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 and take a seat here, you know? He all in sweats and everything. He don't even look like, you know, he, he's about to enter in that era, but he, he decided to do something with that. In fact, he used a lot of that to pour into business, uh, buildings to be exact, um, doing construction, and the Lord allowed him to have that mechanism to be able to fund and sow in into the ministries, all right? You know? And so, when God puts something in your lap, all right, make sure that you utilize that to give Him glory, amen? To give Him honor. Some of us will just run away and be like, Cancun, let's go. This, we going here, traveling, Bali, everywhere, right now. You just disappear, shut up all your phones, ain't nobody calling you no more. You be like, I'm gone. <laughs> Like, I say, then what happened to him? It's like five years later, you just like, okay, I'm back. I didn't spit it all. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. Now, look what Jesus says. He says, the one poor widow, everybody say, the poor widow. Okay, came and threw in two mites, which make uh, a quadrant. It's basically, it's like, it's like pennies, okay? It says, so he called. His disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor woman or poor widow has put in more than all of those who have given to the treasury. Okay? Knowing that she gave her last. It says, For they all put in out of their abundance. You're like, Why are we talking about this, Pastor? Because the Holy Ghost want to say something to y'all. He want to say something to all of us. Easy to give when you got the cream at the top. Amen? But when the barrel is running low, that's where it's like, okay, I don't know if I want to, even a drop is a lot. I'm preaching to somebody right now. Help me, Lord. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had. Her whole livelihood. Can you imagine putting your whole livelihood? I told you with the sister, I gave the last $10. There's been so many things I'm not even, I, don't even, I don't even know. I feel like, honestly, lived like three different lifetimes. I'm like, how did the Lord would have me remember something? You know, you know that's a study, right? They say when you go through traumatic experiences, like your mind has a way of like, putting it off, putting it in a shelf and locking it. <laughs> and then I go like, wait a second, things that I've dealt with in the Lord. And I'm like, I really went through that. And the Lord's like, yeah, you went through that. I got you out of that. I went through this too. Yeah, you went through that too. I was like, yeah, that should have broke me. That should have made me go crazy. But it didn't. But the way I felt that moment was like, I want to disappear. And, and that's where it gets down to the heart of it is, will you get to this place where you're like, God, I want to be authentic. I want to make sure my heart is with you. 
Not with the things that, quote, unquote, I feel like I have to gain in this life. Is your security really in Christ? This woman understood something. Jesus recognized her giving. Jesus recognized like, hey, this is real. This is the heart posture that I want behind it. Say, hey, I'll give because, you know, things are going well for me. Help me, Lord. And this is just no knock, but I got to say it the way God tells me it, okay? Because I was like that, y'all. When it was consistent, yeah. Got you. Here's a little extra, fine. But then when it was like a little drought, like, you know, you turn that water faucet, you're like, oh, there ain't nothing coming out. You're running over, like, wait a second. Then it got to a point where I got to depend. Which one do I pay? That's what me and another brother in Christ were talking about years ago. We was like, is it the light bill today? Is it this one? Some going to shut off and then this one be on and then that one go off and then we pay this one. <laughs> Help me, Lord. It's like we juggling stuff. He says, as Jesus was starting out on his way in Jerusalem, a man come running up to him. He said, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's like, teacher, show me how to get eternal life. Jesus told him, why do you call me good? He said, only God is truly good. But to answer your question, he said, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. He said, teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. He most likely was tithing, you guys. If he's obeying all the other 613 Mosaic laws for real, you know what he's doing what he's supposed to do. But something gets exposed. This rich young ruler doing everything he's supposed to do with his money. Taking care of bills, taking care of that. If he got property, that means he's responsible. All that stuff. Amen? He, he ain't struggling. This guy is really managing his stuff. But something happens. Jesus perceived into his soul, looked at the man. Jesus felt genuine love for him, enough compassion to say, I got to tell this dude the real. I got to talk to him. He said, there's still one thing you have not done. He probably thinking like, wait a second, what? He said, go sell all, not some, but all of your possessions, your property, your things you've acquired, and give the money to the poor. You're like, what? He says, and you will have treasure in heaven. As we started in the beginning, storing up and laying up treasures in heaven looks like that. They're like, oh, what? Hold the phone. You're telling me that's what, what some of it looks like? Yeah, in some cases. God put them on the spot. He said, I love you enough to tell you the truth. He said, then you could be my disciple. Then come follow me. Here's his response. He said, this man's face fell. This, this is like utter disappointment. He said, he went away sad for he had many possessions. I've shared this with you guys before and some of you guys know when we preach. I've said, don't let your possessions possess you. Amen? Well, you got extra quiet up in here. Help me, Lord. <laughs> no, God wants to deal with something deep down. Would you be willing to grab all that you had and say, you know what? God, I'm going to follow you. Like, literally, if Jesus, see, we follow Jesus, we ain't seen him. But if he just walked up in here and just was like, you, 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 you. All that you have, drop it, sell it, give it to the poor, follow me. He didn't just say sell it, make a profit. Y'all caught that? Because someone's like me, I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm about to make, this, I got this for a dollar? Okay, 
Let's see if we can get this for ten dollars. <laughs> I can sell this for a little more. He said, "Yeah." And then after that, you you give them to the poor. Oh, mm -hmm. they didn't earn nothing. Why am I giving to them? I earned that. I acquired these things. And God said, yeah, but you can believe me and call me good teacher all, all you want, but you need to recognize me as Lord. Did y'all catch it? Good teacher. He didn't come in his, as Lord. That's the difference, you guys. Some of us look at Jesus as just a good teacher, a good way of thinking, nice philosopher. God is like, no, I am Lord over your life, Lord over your possessions, Lord over your finances. Lord over the bills, Lord over the credits, Lord over all the things that you deal with. The negative and the positive. Amen? Amen? Amen. He's Lord over it all. He says, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? This amazed them. But Jesus said again, dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. He said, in fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Okay, what that means is, legitimately, it actually was talking about a very tiny area of the external walls of the city, okay? Because I know people think the eye of the needle, like, they think, <laughs> like a sewing kit or something. No. God is saying it's hard for them to get through. He says to enter into the kingdom. He said, the disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved? They asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But not with God. Everything is possible with God. Is this saying rich folk ain't going to make into the kingdom? No, that's not what it's saying. It's saying it's hard. When you put a lot into your possessions. Because ultimately, even though we say they don't define you, people like them. They like their stuff. And you can have them. They go come here today, gone tomorrow. But God is saying, where's your heart in all this? Now. I'm going to give you some tithing and giving. And the reason why I separate it. Tithing and giving because, truth be told, there's no New Testament reference that says you have to tithe 10%. You guys understand that? Okay? I'm just going to tell you guys so y'all know the Holy Ghost is I'm speaking truth to you guys. All right? But there is something God wants to do beyond our generosity has to be over, over abundant now. Especially if you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is where true following comes into play. Now, let's look at some of these scriptures. It says the Bible does not require Christians to tithe, but it does encourage them to give to the church. Did you catch it? Encourage them to give to the church. In fact, it was a common practice that happens. Right. But it was out of. A heart posture of motivation, of encouragement, not manipulation. Amen? Not, hey, like you see some people that I call it just witchcraft. And I, I am sorry if anyone experienced that. If anyone experienced that type of manipulation. Because it is real. We've prayed for people through deliverance and things like that. And they tell us, not naming names, but they tell us, hey, I gave 24K to this ministry. And they, and they ran off with the money. I found out they were scamming people left and right. It was just like, what, what, what transpired with it? And there's nothing wrong with sowing into something, but it was the reason behind it. So a thousand dollars, your body's going to get healed. What kind of nonsense is that? That's what we call that. Ain't prophesying. That's prophet lying. All right. That's that's what 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 a, what a comedian said. He said he said you operating and not in the prophetic but the pathetic. Okay. You giving people stuff that's not biblically sound. 
And it's happening all over the place, you guys. And I know we want to believe that it's true like that. You know what the Bible says about having income and having possessions and things like that? It says, if anyone follows me and loses family, possessions, property, right? All these different things. He said, for my name's sake, for my name's sake, he said, I will restore it to them. This is Jesus. I will restore it to them. He said, a hundredfold in this life and in the next life to come. That's God's blessing. So that is what we look like when we talk about trusting in him. Lord be like, okay, you ain't got, you know, blasted. I say, Lord, I gave this thing up. I gave the condo. I gave the, the, the apartment, you know, for, for your name's sake. He's okay. Don't worry. Ten years, you'll be in the house. <laughs> oh, I gave up the house. Okay, don't worry. You're going to have some properties. <laughs> okay. Even if you didn't have it, you still going to serve me? See what I mean? But then in his generosity, is, it's so beautiful, you guys. Let me read the rest for you guys. I want to encourage y'all a little bit. It says, the importance of giving gener generously, consistently, and joyfully. Okay? You see it in the New Testament. Old Testament tithing was required as a tax, literally, for the nation of Israel. Okay? He says, on a budget. He says, uh, Jesus fulfilled the Mosaic law, Right? Uh, the obligation to tithe was abolished, right? However, for Israel, but it is a principle still between the priest, right? Um, God, and then the one that's being served, okay? It says, uh, Old Testament commands on tithing, as we see, it says Jesus was not advocating this for his return, okay? So when people say, you don't tithe, you ain't saved. Don't believe in that nonsense, okay? But... Your conscience is bearing witness. And if the Spirit of God is telling you that we actually are supposed to be going beyond, and if you're like, I want to tithe like the Israels did, okay, 23% then. <laughs> you've, been telling, you've been telling yourself something else when actually it's been this. And here's, just imagine what the body of Christ, if we can just come together and think about this. Do you know that God wanted us to go beyond just one nation? He deals with Israel. Now he deals with the church. And what does he tell us? Make disciples of every nation, amen? How do we do that? We got to be filled with the Spirit. And when we're filled with God's Spirit, we're going to be generous, you guys. We're going to want to look out for each other. You know what the early church did? They gave all what they had to one another. Then in today's economy, that's straight up that y'all already know. If everybody came together and we just, you see, you would find out real quick. See, they was getting rocked by the Holy Spirit. By his love. Today, in, in capitalism, come on. Y'all 401k, everything, and now we're going to drop this off to another brother that ain't did nothing? Y'all going to be like, ah, nope. Let. You'd be like, hand it over. You'd be like, hand it over. Get out. Get Deacon's hand. <laughs> Pull his hand. I'm serious. People came in like, I got $50, and you got 50 k like, uh, hey, brother, I appreciate you, but yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to do this. That early church was like that, y'all. Today, we would call that a cult. Because <laughs> they'd be like, oh, y'all went and put in the same pot, and everybody's taken care of? But God was like, that's straight love. That's what I desire for you guys. Y'all don't understand that it's almost like the parable of the what he called when he was the, the 11th hour. He said all the, the servants were getting paid a certain wage. And then somebody came at the last minute like, huh, huh. like I, I want to work, too. Be like, OK, going to work. And they'd be like, OK, here's your wage. A thousand dollars. Be like, what? Wait a second. You only did. You only work for one hour. You get a thousand dollars. And this other person worked for 10 hours. The other one worked for five. And he stayed, got a thousand. But here's the thing. Don't hate on God's generosity. Don't hate on the one that is good. Yeah, he took care of this one and you've been serving for a little bit. But the one that just came in, he's like, hey, I'm going to shed my grace on that person, too. I see, this is the thing, the heart of the church, y'all. I'm praying if we can get to this place, y'all, 
of true, authentic worship to the Lord and stop playing with him. And saying, God, what type of sacrificial giving is expected? He said, Jesus focused on sacrificial giving, praising the poor widow who gave out of her poverty, commanding a rich young ruler to sell everything. We saw that, that those scriptures earlier. It says the New Testament instructs Christians to give in a proportion to their wealth. OK, it says in keeping with income, it says does not mean that Christians should not give uh, uh, should give a strict 10 percent of their income. Instead, they should give as they are able, which may sometimes mean even being more than 10 percent. And I'm going to tell you straight up. There's been times where the Lord say, put this over here. I mean, Lord, but that's not 10 percent. That's like 45 percent. God's like, boy, the way he talked, I didn't, I didn't stutter. I didn't stutter. Tell <laughs> me, Lord. He was just telling me, he said, I don't say it like that. He's just like, but I'll be telling you. Like, it'd be like crickets. I'd be like, let me like, did I, did I hear that correct? You said this much? He said, I said this much. He said, and go so into that brother's life. And do this. So I'd be like, okay. That's, that's the same. Now it's just okay. Before I used to be like, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> oh. Maturity is a beautiful place to be in, y'all. It's a beautiful place to be in. God say, what you going to do with that last little, like I told you guys before, account overdrawn, whole nine, and I got $10 in my pocket, hot, got gas on E, and then Sister Vonda asked me, she said, Path, Path, can you, can you give me $10? Uh, $10? I said, exact $10? I didn't say that to her, but I said that to the Lord in my mind. I said, the exact amount I have in my, in my wallet. And he was just like, give her the 10. I heard it so clear. Give her the 10. I was like, no. Everything inside of me was like, no. Crazy. No. But I did it. And, and to be honest with you, I've seen so much of God's favor and grace in my life. It's not even funny. And then when people say, would you do it again? I'd be like, a thousand times over. Because I just know when you're in the hands of God, you're in the hands of God, you guys. I'm not saying it don't feel comfortable. It don't. It ain't even supposed to be. Okay? But this is the beautiful thing about being in a relationship, a love relationship with your father, your heavenly father. All right, let me give you guys some scripture so we can be up and out of here. Double honor. You guys heard of this term, right? Double honor. Okay, let me guys give you guys a little context. Paul's using this quotation, 1 Timothy 5.17. It states that elders who teach and preach well should be given double honor. Paul's point is that pastors, elders, amen, should, be not, should not be taken advantage of or underpaid for their work. Okay, what is their work? Teaching and preaching the word of God. And I know this kind of cuts. Because y'all know me, I love the word of God. I love this word. I love pouring into souls. But a lot of times people be like, oh, I'm going I'm to give $300 to this ministry. I'm going to give 1000 over to here. Then they come in our thing and they be like, oh, this is supposed to be just whatever. Thank you, but, you know, I appreciate. And I understand if you ain't got it like that, I'm saying that. But I'm just saying that there's got to be a place where you know, hey, this is really helping me. This is what the Bible is actually commanding me to do. I'm going to show you guys the scripture. I ain't making this stuff up. He said, we honor God when we stretch ourselves and give from the, very, from the first of what we have. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Giving has always been a form of worship in the Bible. And we are commanded to honor and glorify God in this way. Giving is a form of worship that honors God, right? It can be expressed in love, gratitude, trust, obedience, the whole nine, right? It could bring joy, inspire others to worship, right? We see these different examples like Mary anointing Jesus' feet, right, with expensive ointment, so forth, okay? Now, the word of the Lord says this, always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do is ever useless, which means 
Anything we do for the Lord Jesus Christ, even our giving, amen, is never in vain. Hallelujah. Do you guys know that? You got to know that. Don't ever get your heart in this old weird space of like, man, um, I'm glad like I just held on to my don't be that. Look, in the body of Christ, there should be no stinginess. OK. Now, let me give you guys some scriptures supporting giving in the actual local body. OK, you get fed. If your inner man's getting fed, God is saying pour into what this is happening, what's happening here. That's a part of sowing. That's a part of fruitfulness. Okay? Now, Paul speaks to the church and says, Now, regarding your question about money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, he said, You should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. So, there was a procedure that was already established in the early church. Okay? Where there was a collection, there was some type of giving. It was a part of their process, their worship. He said, on the first day of each week, you should put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there, <laughs> me Lord, and then try to collect it all at once. Now, that's, now Paul is really putting some umph on it, right? He's saying, don't be showing up like, okay, we count one, two peso, three, five, five two, five. Hold on, let's count over again. <laughs> two, four, six, eight, ten, one. Two, four, six, eight. We're just going over it again. All right? They put enough ones, put enough fives. That's a denarii. What's that? Okay. He says, when I come, he said, I will write letters of recommendation for your messengers to choose to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. Okay? It was considered a gift. Amen? That's what it is. Monetary finance. God is saying this is a gift. Right? He's the greatest, he's the greatest gift, period. Amen? He's the giver. God is saying, pour that. Honor me with your wealth. Second Corinthians says, brothers and sisters, he's I want to know. I, uh, 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 I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God, uh, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. Check out. They are being tested by many troubles. They're going through it and they are very poor. OK, he said, but they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. He said, for I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. So to say, oh, but we ain't balling like that, it don't mean that you can't be generous, though. Amen? Amen? See, we think, oh, everybody got to be six figures up in here. Everybody got to be multiple uh, this and that, and then we can just take off. No, God is just looking for a generous heart. Amen? That's the truth. He says, and they did not, he said, they did it of their own, everybody say free will. Free will. Nobody put them in a headlock. <laughs> the Holy Ghost compelled them. Amen. There was no manipulation. Oh yeah, brother, you're going to get that blessing. I, I hear it on oh, the spirit of the Lord. Ah, oh, five, uh, I think I see a five and I see a K, five K. And it's, it's not you running, okay, brother? It's not about running. OK, but the Lord does want you to run for the Lord. But you have to give 5K today. You, I'm not even going to pray for you. Just as long as you ushers. Come on. Go, go. I seen it. Amen. We seen it. Help me, Lord. I seen like one point five million raised in like less than an hour. Is it 20, 20 minutes? Oh. See, that's what I'm trying to say. We've been at conferences. We've been at all types of stuff. And people I was like, man, you got that much. What? I saw them, you know, drink some Gatorade in the lobby. Like, how you doing? And they got, he's like, who got 100K? Somebody walk up and say, like this. I'll be like, what, what, what? I need binoculars. Like, you just got that sitting, chilling? You know, a far event and all the stuff that they gave the vision of what they wanted to do and all this stuff. And I'm like, these people came so quick just for this. And I thought to myself, like, man, like, you know, I ain't trying to build a whole city or nothing, but at the very least, like, you could just be appreciative and just say, hey, let me just follow the word of God and let me give out of the abundance, right, out of the generosity of my heart. And if that's beyond 10 percent, let that be. Let the Lord use you in that way because it's all Bible. 
It's all Bible. He says, they begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in a gift for the believers in Jerusalem. He said, they did even more than what we hoped for, for their first action was to give themselves, to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. He says, so we urge Titus who encouraged you, your giving in the first place to return, you, to, re, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. Okay, I know we talk about we got different ministries. <laughs> Hello, sir, brother. I got, I, got, I, got, I got y'all here super long, but we about to be done. We got deliverance ministry, healing ministry. Okay, what about the giving ministry? What about Romans 12 when it says, is your gift giving? What did y'all think that was? Everybody be like, oh, I don't have the gift of giving. I don't know about that. Prophesy? Yes, I'm going to prophesy. Let's go. <laughs> Words and knowledge? Blue sweater? Okay. <laughs> like diversity in tongues? Okay, I, da, 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 da. okay, I got it. <laughs> All these other gifts we want. Gifts of wisdom, right? We act like we want to shoot like fireballs out of our hand. Out in the name of Jesus. You know, on people. But then the Lord says, yeah, but what about the, the gift of giving? The gift of serving. You're like, ooh. It's like one person up in here. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> like, no, it should be everybody. We should be giving with a mindset that's not so caught up in, well, what about this? What about that? What about it? This is your God on the throne. He's selected. He has called you into this thing. He has called you to operate in faith, not by sight. He says, I'm not commanding you, check it out, to do this, but I'm testing, look at that, how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. And the Corinthians had a whole lot of problems, okay? He's saying there's people giving and they ain't even got a lot. They go beyond and they ain't even really like that. He said, you know the generous grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Here is my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, he said, you were the first who wanted to give. And you were, look, look, there was a collection. Catch it. The organization was constantly pouring into one another, looking out for each other. And then we think locally, it's like, what? Pa pastor's supposed to just win the lotto or something? No. <laughs> Keeping it a buck with y'all. Because that's not how it goes biblically. Well, was they waiting for Apostle Paul to become Apostle Bill Gates? And he was just going to just do well and say, oh, yeah, I'm coming back. I got you guys. I didn't create a new uh, 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 tent process. We use a microchip and some other stuff. <laughs> and now we're going to use this, and now all the churches are going to go forward. That's not how it went, y'all. The church believed in each other. They believed in the living God moving through them, through generosity, through love, through compassion. And they went above and beyond, even if they had some problems. They said, we want this thing to go forward. We know that God called us here. We know that this is a part of his kingdom. He said, last year, you were the first ones that wanted to give. He said, you were the first to begin even doing it. He said, now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. He said, whatever you give is acceptable if you would give it eagerly. And give according to what you have, not what you don't have. He said, of course, I don't mean you giving he said, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. He says, I only mean that there should be some equality. He said, right now you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later then, he said, later they will have plenty and can share with you when you need it. He says, in this way, things will be equal, as the scriptures say. 
Those who gathered a lot and had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. This is Old, Old Testament scripture. But thank God he has given Titus the same enthusiasm for you that I have. Titus welcomed my request that he visit you again. In fact, himself was very eager to go see you. He said, we are also sending another brother with Titus. All the churches praise him as a preacher of good news. Okay. It says he was appointed by the churches to accompany us as we take the offering to Jerusalem. So there was a process. This is what I'm trying to show you guys. There was a process of giving, looking out for each other, right? Taking the initiative, okay? But then you see that there was some type of subjugation to the body of Christ, okay? And when I say subjugation, I say accountability. Do you guys know what accountability is? Does anybody know what that word means? Okay, accountability, look out for each other, but not just look out for each other, but take heed to what someone's saying. Amen? Let me see. I want to give you guys some other stuff, and this is, this is going to help us. Um, let me see. 2 Corinthians 9, and I think we'll wrap it up with this. He says, I don't really want, uh, I don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem. He says, for I know how eager you are to help, and I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece uh, were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to, be in, to begin giving. But I am sending these brothers to be sure you are really ready, as I have been telling them and that your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. He said, <laughs> basically, don't be making me look bad, all right? He says, we would be embarrassed not to mention your own embarrassment if some Macedonian believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all I had told them. He says, so I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promise is ready. But I want it to be a willing, uh, uh, I want it to be a willing gift, not one giving grudgingly. He said, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must decide, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. He said, and God will generously provide all you need. He said, then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. He says, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer. Hallelujah. And then bread to eat. God's like, bring in the dough. I'll make the bread. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's like, you need, to, you need to have your mindset ready. He says, in this same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when, you, and when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. It says, so two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. He said, as a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. They will pray, he said, and they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for the gift too wonderful for words. Hallelujah. Come on, let's stand. Now, y'all like, you're talking all about this. When you guys get a chance, I'll give you some extra credit scriptures or something. Y'all can look later. But I want to be real about this now. I need, the Lord needs us to start pouring in. And what I mean by that is we're saying, God, I want to honor you in every area of my life. Now, you know, for some time here in this ministry, I've only asked typically for offerings um, on Sundays. And that's just something I did. You guys know that I'm a working pastor. Amen. <laughs> I got business and 
Even when business is good and business is not good, I still pour into the kingdom. I still do that, right? God has poured so much into my life, I can't even imagine myself not looking out. But even when we went from different places to just being in our house, to the community center, to now here, and as God wants to grow this thing, he knows that it can't be a one-man band. Amen? It's just not like that. And so however God had pulled you into this thing, hear me out. What he desires for us is to get us to a place where everything that we have truly belongs to him. And now God has just called us to be excellent stewards over it. Amen? That you would be a good manager. And your generosity is counted as treasures in heaven. Amen? That you're saying, I don't want to do this. I'm going to pour into this. So for the, for the teaching and the preaching of the word of God, as the word of God says, the double honor means really pouring into the, the, the priest, the minister. Now, personally, ain't none of this stuff I'm earning like that, all right? Even though legitimately that's what the Bible says. Everything does go back into this, all right? In fact, we are a 501c3, a nonprofit religious or organization, all right? So whenever you guys sow into this stuff, it's going to a separate account, separate entity, not even what I touch, right? Everything is clearly lights, this building, that's it. And, and then when we go out and feed the homeless and do different stuff like that, right? Buy some hot dogs, whatever, you know what I mean? But I just want you guys to have something, know something. If the Holy Ghost is working on your heart right now. Even if you ain't got a lot right now in your life, whatever you do give, give it unto the Lord. Say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this here. Yeah, you may have wanted to buy something over here or buy this over there or whatever. You're going to say, God, I want to pour into what's happening here. I believe your hand is upon this. I'm going to follow your word. I trust in you. I trust in you. That's the biggest thing. I trust in you. I'm going to give all of my heart, not 99% of it, all of it today. And I'm going to honor you with my wealth. Amen? Amen. So this is just an opportunity. If you guys, before we pray, um, if you guys want to pull up on the screen. I know this is different because you're like, wow, this is, this is our teaching. But biblically speaking, this is what I'm actually supposed to do. Okay? Biblically speaking, every time I teach and preach, this is what's supposed to happen. All right? Biblically speaking. What we're doing is I want you guys to have the full counsel of God, to know that God is looking at all of this. All right? I can prepare you guys just for a moment, even if it's something you want to go sow into uh, uh, an envelope, you can do that. All right? But I'm going to give you guys a moment um, to prepare an offering. You know, if you've already done your tithes, amen, praise God, bless you, we've already prayed for it, okay? But if there's an offering, something you do feel in your heart, you say, you know what, God, I do want to sow um, out, of, out, of, out of encouragement, out of motivation, right? Not manipulation, because ain't none of that happening here, all right? I've been, I've been pressed so many times to give. Um, it's, it's sometimes it's strange, but I know it's because God just wants us to trust him that much more. All right? So as you guys kind of prepare yourselves, you know, I'm going to cover it, uh, cover your offering in prayer, um, and, uh, and then see you guys out in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Those of you that are watching right now, um, if you guys want to pull up the Tithely app, we're on Tithely. You can go on Venmo at NCCMFAM7 and Cash App, uh, that's the dollar sign, <laughs> NCCMFAM7. If you guys already have that. Like I said, if you've already tithed, amen. You know, we're not pressing you, but... Um, you know, there's something that the Lord, I believe the Holy Spirit does speak, amen, and he'll speak to our hearts and, and, and tell us to, to pour in, all right? Okay. 
So it looks like you guys are ready. I'm just going to pray over it. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the opportunity to give, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for being so generous in our lives, Lord Jesus. Despite what's going on, Lord Jesus, I pray right now that this offering, Lord Jesus, that this be a seat, Lord Jesus, that brings fruitfulness to their lives, Lord. Lord Jesus, Lord, let them be stirred up even more, Lord, to be a generous, um, to be a giver, Lord Jesus, a servant, Lord. Lord Jesus, I pray that you pour in a multitude of your desires into their hearts, Lord, that they can start stepping out on faith, Lord, that they can start encouraging and building each other up with the truth, Lord, and the love that only comes from you. I pray for your wisdom, Lord, and I pray right now, Lord Jesus, that if there are things in their lives, Lord Jesus, wisdom from above, Lord, you said put them to the test, or put you to the test, Lord. I pray for a blessing that's so overwhelming, Lord Jesus, to come in their lives, Lord. I pray, Lord Jesus, that their vats be filled, Lord Jesus, that their barns, Lord Jesus, come in abundance, Lord, that whatever they do have right now, whatever they are managing, Lord, that you give them the wisdom to even manage more, Lord, that they can even grow more, Lord Jesus, that there are ventures and things that they want to step out into, Lord, that, that people have grace and favor just comes out of nowhere, Lord Jesus, because you touch the hearts of people to look at their lives and say, I want to sow into you. I want to build you up. I want to, I, want to, I want to bring a promotion to you today. I want to be able to do these things. And they know, let them know that it is your hand, Lord, that guides them. Let them know, Lord, that it is truly your favor, Lord Jesus, that moves that moves the needle, Lord Jesus. So I thank you right now, Lord, for being the one that, 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 that provides all, Lord Jesus, that secures us, Lord. I ask, Lord Jesus, that the offering be blessed, Lord Jesus, be abundant, Lord Jesus. Um, bless them, Lord Jesus, in many other areas, Lord, even with health, Lord Jesus. If there's health issues, Lord Jesus, going on, Lord, I pray right now for provision, for favor, Lord Jesus, and supernatural grace, Lord, to be in their lives. I pray most of all, Lord Jesus, for your presence to be with them and your protection to be in their lives, Lord, and all that they do and say. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Okay, you guys be blessed in the name of Jesus. Remember, Freedom Friday is August 23rd. You guys can come through that. All right? That's prayer, deliverance, baptisms, the whole nine, Sunday worship at 12. By the way, if you guys want to come on Sundays, like if you guys come at 1130, for some of you guys that want to help set up is at 11, but 1130, I do still want the men to pray. I noticed that <laughs> maybe some of you guys weren't doing prayer, but the men and the women, you guys separate to pray before service. Okay. Um, and yeah, let that be that in Jesus name. You guys have a good night. Amen. Bless y'all.